Welcome to the Neophytes of Narratology, the internet's most pretentious and pseudo-intellectual pursuit since, perhaps, Nietzsche's thus podcast, Zarathustra, or Camus' renowned vlog of Sisyphus. While lesser men aspire to stand on the shoulders of mere giants, we at the Lost Signals will accept nothing less than titans. So join us as we delve into the fundamentals of narrative nuance and critique the critics who proclaim to know the universal qualities of effective storytelling. Hello and welcome back to part two of Neophytes of Narratology, review of Roland Barthes S.Z. I'm Jonathan A. Manzer. Here with Scott Thurlow. Rollin, 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 rollin' bot. <laughs> and Stephen Hello. Hermosi. <laughs> Hello. So when we last left off, we did the first nine sections of SZ, mm. which basically were his kind of introduction to this world. Prologue, kind of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where he kind of dealt with methodologies with doing like literary criticism and where he's coming from. Now, section 10 starts off with the titular Saracen, which is yeah. the story he is reviewing in the system he's created. So, Scott, would you like to give a brief refresher? We've done an entire podcast on Saracen, but a brief sure. refresher because we're going to be referencing his reference to that work throughout. <laughs> a, a recursive reference, sure. So, as a brief reminder, uh, it's a Balzac story, Honoré de Balzac, short story uh, Saracen in which a unnamed narrator – is at a Parisian party attempting to somewhat woo slash flirt with a attractive woman that he has met or has brought to the party. And then the story then unfolds the question of the family who is throwing the party that they are at. What is the mystery behind the old man who appears at their parties, who is related to the family, but no one knows, like no guest seems to know for sure, except for the narrator who uh, uses it sort of as a ploy to make a deal with his uh, paramour that, oh, I know the story and I will tell you all about it. So he sort of like a story within a story that Saracen was a sculptor um, who was sort of, I guess, socially removed, I guess I want to say. Yeah. He was he was sort of like a, a reclusive genius who moved to uh, Italy and then fell in love with a castrato, but unbeknownst to him, he did not know that this person was a castrato. He just thought it was a beautiful woman who was uh, sort of aloof from him. And it unfolded into a tragic love story, essentially, in which Saracen gets murdered at the end, and the uh, the old man is, in fact, the castrato. Mm-hmm. And so it all ties back together and is left sort of open-ended at the end of the story. So how... Bart goes about analyzing this work is through an extremely a close reading of Saracen to the point of losing the forest for yes. the trees. Yeah, that is exactly it's, correct. It's it's obnoxious in a certain sense of how <laughs> close the close it's reading really funny becomes. And the thing is, it it is, and it's kind of weird because. It's almost as if he has end footnotes and end notes mm-hmm. that he just inserts like willy nilly. I don't want to say throughout. randomly, but like tangentially, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes the the musings, I'm going to call them, it's attached to a point he just made in the close reading, and other times it seems like he got bored of doing a close reading and was <laughs> and said, like "Oh, daydreaming," and then wrote goes up. This is about parody and irony. Yeah. So to now, so this is basically a tale of two stories here. You have the philosophical musings on literary theory, and you have the close reading. But there's not much to say about the close reading because it's an incredibly close reading. It is beaten to death. <laughs> yeah. If we were to analyze the close reading, it would be us creating an audio book. <laughs> of yeah. what he did there's not, not much to only say. would it be redundant it would be something like that yes yeah. redundant and also it would be boring to listen to because we, you'd constantly need to reference a work reference both a uh, an analysis and the <laughs> yeah. work 
and it would just be it's it's far too much. So too I'm more interested. For that. And the thing is, it's his close reading is more of examples of his uh, literary theory anyway. Mm. So I I'm much more interested in what he has his musings. Mm. His kind of um, tangential his like, asides. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that's how we're going to proceed in this. The issue is it's going to seem almost disjointed because sometimes he because it, they it, themselves it are disjointed. Yeah. Yes, but you're not going to as a listener. You're not going to have the reference to why he's necessarily bringing up some of these mm-hmm. comments. But he doesn't often explain why he's bringing up these comments. So They're it's going to seem there. haphazard, mm-hmm. but. This is how the book is, and we might reference the story in the close reading to clarify, or if something particularly was interesting, but this is just going to be the literary theory as described by Bart. Yeah. Mm. So uh, we're going to do a close reading of that. Section 10 now, of where we left off is, he begins by asking, like, why did he choose Saracen as the story, which was basically because. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't he give just, a good reason yeah. at all. He's like, ah, oh, someone referenced this, and I wanted to do a story anyway. This one was good enough. <laughs> so, again, I'm... Um, is it basically, he's like... Uh, I he, feel like it was the first short story that he read after he decided no. that he wanted to he do says, this. He does say, like, like he briefly covers it, where it happened to come up in a, a different, like, an, a contemporary to him analysis, or someone suggested it to him. He's like, and like, he just said, oh, yeah, sure, okay, I'll try it with this story. Yeah. And that's his whole reason. So he then goes into the five codes, and this will be covered in this in ten and eleven. He really dis- uh, discusses this, right. the five codes to how he's going to analyze the story. So this is actually a section I would like to talk about uh, a bit because I feel that he covers everything, but I don't know if it is it can be divided further. Uh, Honestly, I think this is the most important part of the yes. book. This is where he lays out. It's actually his thesis, if yeah. you will, when this he is, finally gets to it. This is where he lays out how he's going to yes. actually do this uh, close reading that he's about to do. Right. So the first section is uh, Hermeneutic Code, which in a recent narratology episode, we dis- discussed No Carroll's idea of narrative closure. Mm-hmm. And that's basically all it is. It's right. the... It's what is in service to the questions that are raised throughout a work. By the story, yeah. yeah. What are the questions that are addressed? What are the enigmas, as he mentioned, that yes. are addressed? And yeah. how do we uh, – and like, what are the f- following – not maybe not actions, but references to those questions? How they sort of like flow in and out. Yes. Yeah. And this was, this was an interesting thing because this, the enigmas of the story, as you just pointed out, were some of the most interesting things that he pointed out because this was – Basically, the idea of what are the what are the questions that this story poses, and how, how and are they answers answered? It. Sure. So there's actually two reference right away. Saracen, right? He brings up the title that initially brings up questions. Like sort of what itself if, is a mystery. What? Who? Kind of an enigma, if you will. Yeah, and then also that Saracen. I, I didn't know this. It was a uh, in French. It was a feminine uh, mm-hmm. article, uh, to, right. and th- th- so. Like, why is this female versus male? Right. Uh, How does it relate to yes. uh, his broader um, overview? It's a, it's a really interesting um, point of French wordplay, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like something that I didn't know or yeah. I couldn't you have possibly picked up on you because can't get that I'm effect not, in English. I'm not a French reader the point. Or, a, sure. or, or a French speaker, but it's it's this interesting idea of like of wordplay. And he kind of this is one of the things that I'm glad about this book for. Is that it points out the the idea that there is this wordplay going on that you as an English reader would never know you probably unless was it over was your pointed head. out yeah. to you. Yeah, sure. So the second code is the semantics code, which deals with basically the linguistics of the uh, work tenses, um, basically the use of the, grammar and yeah, so the, forth and stuff like that. Yeah, and basically the analysis of the I'm going to mispronounce this the sem. The semi, I believe it's the sem. That's yeah. how I took it's, it. Yes, uh, which is the base unit signifier of semantics, right? And it's again, it's like, a binary composition of a of a sentence, if you will. So the third one, and I mean, I don't think there's much else to say. Uh, no, I mean, analysis of the grammar. Just laying out this is what yeah. he's going to use to to uh, and, you yeah. know apply to his analysis. So the third is the symbolic code, which is the use of 
imagery. He's particularly a fan of antithesis. Yes. Which, again... He it, certainly is. Yeah, uh, I don't know what his necessary obsession with this specific use of uh, uh, symbolism, because there are certainly f- a far greater set Symbolic of... Symbolic words, sure. ...use of uh, symbols... But again, he brings up the uh, antithesis constantly throughout this. I think I think the idea of the antithesis, at least in Bart's view, mm-hmm. is very very important in this because it's like the idea of the women versus the men in this. It's mm-hmm. the idea of the uh, castrato versus the sure, it's, it's empowered like the, the X versus you know, Y dynamic. If and you will. and I'm not sure that I don't I don't want to say that it's. Not the right reading, but like you know, I'm not sure that's, the right. That reading doesn't have to the be reading I'm giving you, <laughs> of course. Sure, but no, I, it doesn't I, I have to be point. the reading the way that you read right. this, but it is certainly the way that he reads it. And there, we actually did bring up, I believe, in our review of uh, Saracen, the, the life death. The, the, sure, the, there was a lot of that imagery being yeah. played around with. Uh, so I, I guess I see see that, but I think that he goes again. He goes a little too far with a lot of things, yeah. and we'll bring it up when that we get to that point. Sure. But uh, the fourth one is the action code, which is basically the temporal and causal nature of a story. And I think he later on he brings up that this is one of the few that actually give life to a story. Mm-hmm. Uh, the yeah. other codes are kind of s- stagnant. This is what actually. C- more fluid brings kind the, of, yeah. Um, yeah, of course, it's the causal it's nature of animated. It. Yeah, yeah of course. Animates the story. It's just, I mean, it's just going to be, but that's one of the ones that it uses to analyze, yes. It's also the, uh, I'm going to butcher this too, the pro code, which is based off an Aristotelian concept from Poetics. Um, but I, he references that throughout, but I'm going to call it the action code for the so sake for of not of butchering yes. Greek. <laughs> yeah. And then the final one is the referential code, which is the expected knowledge that the writer contextual kind yeah. of things. Yeah. So, like, uh, he brings up an interesting point of that Saracen references a um, a, a clock tower, I believe, that signifies that this party is in the wealthy district. Right. That I didn't know because I don't have the context of have the, uh, yeah. France at that date and time. There there was a lot of stuff like that where he was yeah. like, oh, yes, because they talked about the, I don't remember anything off the top of my head, but like, because they talked about this, that means that they are at a wealthier party or like, you know, because they talked about this, right. that means that, you know, they're like qualifiers. This, uh, that, that, that means that they are in this time frame or whatever, what have you. Like, there's a lot of that type of stuff in, as far as the referential code goes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, no, my big question now is I think that's basically covering uh, all that we could read off quotes or go more in depth, but I think that's the basic everything you need to know no, about that's it. That's like his framework. Yeah. Is it? Is that it, or should it be divided further? Well, uh, like you said a bit uh, uh, going into this, that I think it is it. To answer your question, I think you could probably sort of those are the big umbrellas, if you will, that you could categorize anything else would fall onto one of these right so if you yes you could break it down more but i think that's unnecessary so you know i I would have to say good on bart for not doing more than five i think any aspect of his analysis is can fall easily under these five and that makes it manageable at least to a certain extent yeah i i think that you can break this down a lot more if you if you want it to want it it's not necessary but i think that uh bart did a good job Putting everything under these five codes and and going from there, I, yeah. I think he tried to break it down into the most basic. Yeah, it's it's perfectly uh, fine enough, and it works. Yeah. I guess I want to say, I yeah, I would agree. So we're on to twelve now, which is the weaving of voices, which is where he starts getting into his grandiose starts meandering a bit. Yes, but also yeah, sure, go on. Now, basically, the major theme is that. These codes kind of are independent threads that are woven together to create the structure of a story. Right. Actually, I wrote down a thing. It's kind of like that the, earlier in the first uh, part, we discussed the Riley text versus the Ridley text. Mm-hmm. The Riley text is kind of that platonic viewpoint of the pure uh, potential of what that story could have been. And the Ridley text is the product that came out. It's sort of the codes are the footprints 
left as the writerly text <laughs> yes. becomes the readerly text. I actually think he describes his footprints. Yes, and I will read it. Um, at least the a quick uh, sort of synopsis of it. And in, in the section, he writes, for example, the kidnapping section refers to every kidnapping ever written. There are so many fragments of something that have has has always been already read, seen, done, or experienced. The code is the wake of that. Mm -hmm. But I think I, I agree with that. Or I found it interesting. I think it's a valid point there. So I I think that's and that's what he's. I exploring. think that's an interesting point as well. Is it's this idea that every time that some kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, like meme is written in yeah. a novel, it is kind of uh, an echo of previous ways exactly. that, has, that yeah. that's been written. I'm going to throw another quote here. Yeah. The blanks and looseness of analysis will be like footprints marking the escape of the text. For if the text is subject uh, to some form, this form is not unitary, architect, uh, architectronic, finite. It is the fragment, the shards, the broken or obliterated network, all of the movements and inflections of a vast dissolve, which permits both overlapping and loss of messages. Yeah. Again, he has this habit. Very of, long winded, but it's still uh, accurate. He, uh, he goes from being very scientific mm -hmm. to very poetic. Yes. Yeah. And I would it, agree. It's. It can be jarring, but yeah. like not quite per se. It just it's it's it, you're expecting to like get into like one certain framework of mind. Okay, I'm gonna he's gonna analyze it in such a way, and I'm prepared to go along with him. But then every now and again, I'm like, oh, so also, yeah, yeah, hey, think about this. That has nothing to do with necessarily with what I was just been analyzing. Which makes me think that a lot of these passages are afterthoughts. Yeah, it he could be the case. Like yeah. he had either worked on something. Like I, uh, we'll get into it when we go into parody and irony, which is I think he worked on separately and mm -hmm. inserted it because he felt that he needed. It's to almost break as if up. he already had that little yeah. section I mean, written. I was like, here's a good place to put it mm -hmm. in SE. Yeah, it's certainly. Uh, so I, I, I kind of felt as I was reading it as though he wrote the close reading part of it and then went back and read through it and was like, oh. I have something else to say about this. I'm going to do like a little mm, section maybe, right. about it without being and, uh, sure. Not, it seems, I mean, you maybe get that sense of it. Yeah, I agree with that. Though you can't you can't say whether or not that's actually the case if that's how he actually did it. But that's kind of how it felt as you're yes. reading well, it. Another or as I was reading it, that, anyway. I agree with that. I felt that another author would have put these as footnotes or endnotes. A lot of the topics and instead of you sections know what? unto themselves. You know what? I kind of appreciated that he made them their own sections yes. because those were the best parts of the book oh, to yeah. me. Like, the close reading was not nearly as interesting as those little asides that he did. But, again, he goes back to the, the, my final thought on this, that the writerly is gone. You can't access it ever. Yeah. Uh, it's the perfect of, like, what could have been. You can't capture what you it have. anymore. Yeah. The product is this kind of shadow and the codes, the process it went through. Yeah. The scaffolding of sorts to yeah. build the structure. So now we're on to a part I actually quite like to discuss, which is we looked up the pronunciation of this uh, sitar, guitar, sitar, sitar, C I T A R. Yes, which is a move in bullfighting to like that they used to signal, and I love this. I, I studied a little bit of the philosophy of language and uh, linguistics, and this is was very like neat to me. This concept It's the idea that you have a bunch of descriptors pointing to a, um, a certain object. But because of the nature of a story, this can be spread over the course of a narrative. Right. So what unifies it? It's almost like um, you the idea of uh, a proper name versus he or she. Like you, you, there are certain rules that are set where you can use he or she before it starts becoming confusing, like introducing another proper name right. can um, of the same gender yeah. well, you can't then reference the first as he again <laughs> right. so if I may uh, yeah. it, again in Barsgrenio's terms within the section um, doing that he says breaks up the signifier into particles of verbal matter which makes sense only by coalescing so yeah I mean <laughs> rephrased barely makes sense at all to be honest right like I, I get <laughs> I, I know what that is supposed to mean <laughs> It's just very grandiose, but it, at the end of the day, it's it's his uh, example of ha how that works. Yeah, but I think it's such a profound. The the interesting thing I think find about linguistics and philosophy of language is your language is so intuitive to us, 
and like storytelling is so intuitive to us that we it makes sense with but the logic starts to fall apart when you actually really try to do it, it. Oh, sure. well, I, that's exactly what i would say we use all these rules and we use them for the most part in conversation flawlessly however when you try to describe them it kind of breaks down yeah. a little bit you you don't a lot of times you have problems pointing out why something works or so, how sort of like something works. Trying to grasp at mist. You can't hold yeah. mist in your hand, but it's there and you know it as a structure. Right. So again, this this was an argument I've never heard. Maybe it's been solved already. Maybe another like David Lewis came and developed a <laughs> sure. thing. But this is the first time I've heard of this and it really actually made me respect uh, Bart for bringing this up because I found I, – professionally, I found it interesting. He doesn't really solve it. He just kind of he he creates the uh, the was sitar yeah. as the description for that s- signifiers all pointing to and are indexing this one object, mm-hmm. by which he uses the idea of wealth for this party. The idea that you like you have different things like descriptions for the room or uh, the descriptions of the people signifiers, there, yeah. dialogue that said the descriptions of the. Uh, like the city there, I mentioned earlier the clock tower that signifies that it's in a wealthy part of the. Mm-hmm. So, like I don't know, I don't. Know. He doesn't. I don't think he comes up with an answer here, but he brings up an. But he interesting, introduces it yeah. at least as a concept. Sure, but yeah, it's it's the way that you describe and have your character speak and like all these things together describe the setting that you're in without you necessarily having to say. It was a wealthy part of town and a wealthy party, yeah, you know, yeah. like something like that. Yeah, well, and no, I, it's funny, but it's it's exactly what he's getting at. The greater the uh, syntagmatic distance between two data, the more skillful the narrative. The performance consists of manipulating a certain degree of impressionism. A touch must be light, as though it weren't worth remembering, and yet appealing again later in another disguise. Another guys, that idea that writerly craft comes in with being able to manipulate this um uh, sitar yeah is you don't something you don't really it. yeah but it, when you when you actually like when you do sit down like when as he brings it up you're like hell yeah shit yeah <laughs> you're right about that it's just that you don't often notice it i guess i want to say well that's I mean, and, and if you're a writer when you sit down to write something you try to you try to do that, you know. You try to make sure. you try to At least make the it, good writers will. You try to make it obvious the setting that you're in without making without obviously saying it, you know. Which is right. such a which is such a fine line. Like you, if it's you're, a subtle if you're, difference, but if an you're too one. vague, it, agreed. Of it, course, it'll make no sense. And if you're too specific, it'll feel like it's way too on the nose, right? But to I the think reader. I think this is really. I think this is where he strikes home here. It is his attempt to bring science to an art. Mm-hmm. Into a, or to at least marry them in some sense. Yes. So, I don't know. I, this this impressed me the most of the initial sections we're going to do. So, but uh, any other thoughts on this? No, I don't think so. I, I think, I think we the, went over it pretty well. It. And yeah. yeah, it's it's a very interesting idea. It's a very interesting topic. Uh, probably could be expanded to something much larger. But as far as as he goes, I don't know if there's much more to say about it. I'd rather read Sitar by Roland. Bard <laughs> than I'll agree with that. Fair Let's enough. go on. So we're on to part 14 now. Antithesis 1, the supplement, which is basically him talking about how defining an object by what it isn't. And this is actually used quite a bit in like Aristotle, who, like, when you, when you study, like, the development of how we describe animals and, like, plants, it's like... Dividing it by right. what characteristics they don't possess, the uh, traits they lack, yes. essentially, yeah, and kind of uh, hinting at what something is yeah. by saying exactly what it, isn't. What it is yeah. not, yeah. exactly. So, and it's also these paradoxes to describe. So, he uses the idea of uh, recess uh, for the narrator uh, during the beginning, which is a little bit outside, n- not quite outside, but not quite inside at the same time. Mm. For the nerdier and more modern group, I'm going to use the living the zombies as the living dead, which <laughs> yeah, again is right. a paradox there. But it's not quite living. It's not yeah, quite it, dead. It's somewhere on the in surface between. It is, but you yeah. know, like yeah. you, it, you contextually understand what it's getting at. Mm. Sure. So I think that's basically doing that describes exactly what the his his first stab at antithesis. Yes, yeah. uh, 
there's a lot of that kind of play between living and death and like Dichotomy gender roles like that, and all yeah. that. Yeah. So, but uh, throughout, but all right. The uh, here's a quote: "The antithesis is the battle between two plenitudes set ritually face to face, like two fully armored warriors. The antithesis is the figure of the given opposition, eternal, eternally recurrent. The figure of the inexplicable." Uh, in- Expiable, yeah. yeah. So again, flowery language there, but basically, I broke it down. We just said what he was going yeah. to sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the basic. And now, just real quickly before we go on, yeah, like that I, is. I think that that's an important one because, as we said, as we ourselves pointed out, and he also does, uh, m- way more to the extent, but that it's <laughs> it's uh contained within the story. So you need to be aware of uh, that sort of um, a like it, it even has a little graph a versus a slash b kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's going to recur a lot in the story, so he has to sort of introduce it. And again, to he, use it. He's, I understand what he's attempting to do because he's trying to bring a science to an art form. Right, exactly. As we that said. isn't particularly defined well. So he is giving like the scient or a, a more scientific definition to probably more intuitive acts of writing. Mm, right. So. I, I'll, I'll forgive him for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool, Bart. Yeah. All right. So this next part is, I feel, the last of the beginning section, which is called the full score. And basically saying that narrative is like music. Mm-hmm. And he starts getting very kind of flowery of that. Flowery of that. Again, he gives he a, a diagram. It, yeah. but, I was going to say, yeah, if I recall, he's got like you know a, an actual yep. score. It's like musical notes yeah. as represented like – they're, they're equivalent in sentences almost. And here he is, and he'll bring this up later in, in other sections, but the idea that the codes are not independent of each other. They're sort of like tones that can yeah, really well, play together. They're and, interwoven. Yeah. And, you know, they when play you, off of each other yeah, as well. It, it, they yeah. can be discordant, but they also mm-hmm. can produce nice mm-hmm. harmonies. And again, he... It, it's a great. I think analogy. it's his way of yeah. It's it's a metaphor. Yeah, that's the entirety of the, right. what this section is. I, I think I think the idea is like if they if they are discordant, supposedly it should be by design, by the you know in the same way right. that you can have discord in a in a musical piece and On have purpose. that work together yeah. as long as you know what you're doing as long as you're willing to break the rules. So there's one last part that I would actually like to discuss about the in, uh, the musical score. Where he's saying that it this converts the analysis not into a linear work but into a tabular work. Yes. Although I would like to say it's more of a linear versus geometric mm. way. Like that's another like more mathematical way of looking sure, at but it. But I think it, it's accurate. I, I like yeah. that description. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. The the idea is that codes are complex and they work together. So and that's basically what he goes on with the whole uh, score. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now he goes into what I consider more of less structural discussions and more musings and yes. how different things this work. This one is definitely a musing in capital M. Yeah. So section uh, 16 is about beauty. The idea is that beauty is a metaphor, uh, can only be described through metaphor, like where ugliness can be described like with actual – it's an idealized versus a practical sort of right. Uh, I think this is. I think this is definitely the part where he breaks from the reality of telling a story and kind of goes into his own ideas about this. And and I, I don't know if there's much more to say from my perspective about that, but Ian, I don't think there is much to say because he he makes a good point when you hear about pe- like descriptions of beauty it's generally through metaphor mm, but right. he doesn't have anything to aside from pointing it out i don't think he has anything greater to say about it right i mean I'll, I'll, the only thing i can say is i'll use his own words and he's which in which he writes about beauty in other words beauty cannot assert itself save in the form of of a citation i think that is true but i would say that there is a lot to be said for using metaphor to describe ugliness as well that's where I break away from what Bart is saying in this point of view because he says, you just describe ugliness and you only uh, portray beauty in metaphors. Sure. I think that's kind of, forgive my language, forgive my French, bullshit. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm... <laughs> Nothing to say about that. So we're going to move on to 17 through 19, which deals with 
gender roles and castration, which I don't necessarily want to go into too much depth about what he talks here because it's basically him giving examples of the use right. of like the antithesis in that and uh, you know, basically how – and this is where he I feel that his opinion – where yeah. he starts to build, where he wants to, he wants to insert. I think he actually goes against himself here because he wants to insert yes. the theme of castration, which hasn't been brought up yet in the story mm-hmm. in all of these segments. It's like of he's the story. forcing it upon, like earlier than it should be, if even if it is like outright addressed. Yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> I think that he kind of has a problem with. Uh, as so described, castrados, <laughs> and he wants to bring it up as loudly and often as possible in this. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's funny. That's kind yeah. of what it seems like to me. Like, uh, and I really wish that he had just stuck to a more, uh, I don't know, scientific or like a, a unimpeded version of his, uh, you know, of of the way that he's reading this. Mm. One of the points I do like in this section is the idea of gender roles without necessarily the castration that there's a lot of powerful females in here mm-hmm. and there's – generally the men are weak. The narrator is right. – well, uh, like, uh, The, the yeah. thing we were saying yeah. earlier, but sure. But I don't necessarily think it's the idea of an attempt by uh, Balzac to castrate all the men. Right. It, it just – I think his sense – again, it's reading too much into this. And, and he goes also into the idea that, like, in a sense, capitalism is the castration of the nobility <laughs> at one point. Uh, like, the land yeah. of nobility is loses now. Which, we've yes, replaced it with funny, money. But yeah, sure. he, I, I feel like he reads this story and then he sees castration everywhere. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which I surely did afterwards. <laughs> but um, – so we're going to skip all over. I mean, it's basically examples it's very of narrow symbol, a, symbolism. Yeah. yeah. Then he go, goes back into, in a sense, literary theory here, which mm. is the dissolve of voices in 20, which basically he's discussing how modern day stories, at least, um, or at least when Balzac was writing, uh, like this, uh, 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 was the development of the use of uncertainty in voices as a uh, narrative device, right. where you have basically the hubbub of a room. It's not telling you who said something, mm. but it's kind of like overhearing things. I thought it was an interesting point, like, but I don't think, it, it, again, it didn't, it's more of amusing. Okay. It's it's yeah. there, and yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty basically all there is to it. Yeah, it doesn't carry all that much weight, I guess, but it's something that he noticed and wanted to talk about. Yes. Yeah, like so, I said, just for quickly, the only thing I have to say about it, it goes back to the, the humorous way you phrase it, where he was, you know, doing his um, actual textual analysis of Terracine, and then Sort of like thoughts on this. Oh wait, this is this is an idea I have. Let me insert it here. Yeah, as a sort of a break. I like I said earlier. I I feel like he just read back through his close reading and like just decided to write stuff in where he thought it was <laughs> yeah. you know footnotes. Like, where he thought Extended it was interesting. Footnotes, that's what he said. Sure. Now, twenty one goes into a chapter called Irony and Parody, which is a very strange writing. Scott, would you like to read out some quotes from that? Sure. All right. So I will picked out a couple of sentences that he writes, what could a parody be that did not advertise itself as such? Which I think, I mean, that's valid, right? Like, you have to know it's a parody. To, it has to be clear that it's satirizing something. Right. Otherwise, In, in order to be yeah, validated. Otherwise, yeah. you'll be taking it literally, and then therefore you won't get the, you know, the ironic sense that it's supposed to represent. Right. So he says uh, after that, this is the problem facing modern writing. How to breach the wall of utterance, the wall of origin, the wall of ownership. Which, again, is like a sort of, at this point, classically like grandiose uh, Barth style. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I, I, I do think it's valid. It's just that, again, he, he sort of overdoes it in a sense. Yeah, it's a good core musing, but it doesn't, it's not as clear as he, I think, wants it to be. Or at least could be. Or he doesn't have as much to say about yeah, it as he exactly. would prefer. Right. And I don't think I don't think he really actually says anything about irony or parody here, aside from some kind of like, like you just said about the um, uh, the use of uh, uncertainty, which is like he noticed something, he wrote it down, and now he's moving yeah, it's on. It's like the vaguest of yeah. things, and he's like, "Yeah, I, I wanted to discuss this, but 
not too much in depth, and now oh, now back to uh, your regularly scheduled analysis. Like maybe he felt like perhaps someone else might have something else to say about it, <laughs> yeah. and he just wanted to alert them to the fact that it was present. I don't know, like I said, the the quote that I read out, I thought was like the at least the most uh, well phrased one within this section. Yeah, but it didn't really address it all that much. Okay, so we're moving on to uh, twenty two, and we're actually speeding up very quickly because they're just kind of nods at different yeah. literary theory things or like, like music free little uh, yeah. overviews if you will so the next part is very natural co- actions which discusses causality and closure again uh the idea of like crisis right. in a work and in a sense like what are the verbs that move along a work mm. and, any piece yeah, yeah. Uh, again i didn't find much there isn't of, like much substance to yeah. it i guess i want to say it seems like you're also agreeing with it. Yeah, I'm. Try- I'm actually trying to read through again. Uh, like the idea of like the knot in a that, that needs to be unknotted mm. to make a story work. Sure, but uh, yeah, I guess he that. talks about it feels that like filler. I know that. But. He talks about that much further, much more in depth, and in a better way. And, yeah. I think in other parts explored of this, explored a book. lot more. Uh, uh, the way he wants to specifically. In terms of the idea of the enigmas that he's trying to that you're trying to figure out as the right. reader, and I think that's I think that's kind of the core of what he's doing. A lot of this stuff, like you said, just seems like musings of what he wants to or would would prefer to explore, but perhaps doesn't have the time or you know like he had post-it notes as he was going yeah. through <laughs> yeah wrote a little thing down post-it note and then like oh i'll just yeah. slap this in here you're right that's really funny yeah. and th- i mean a lot of this stuff does read exactly like that. actually you know what it reads like it reads like writings in the margins of a book of someone right. trying yeah. to write like a paper on another text it's like oh or i'll talk about irony and parody here and how yeah. Yeah. ironies are Faces the wall of transgression. Granted, the writings of an intelligent person, like a, yeah, a, a very sure. intelligent person, like the the stuff that was in the margins of my book, it's, it's basically very, said, it's very "Whoa!" Yeah. with an exclamation point yeah. after it's it. It's very but, smartly done, but no. it's, it's like it was, I was saying, it's, we got we we did. I, I will say this is kind of funny. We we all got uh, used copies of this book, and we all had kind of interesting and like funny things yeah. written in the margin, using margin, like writings, you know, but, the funny things like highlighted but, stuff like that. Yeah, but to that point, uh, as Ian was saying, like it reads as if yes, a very intelligent person is making margin notes, but their notes are for them, right. not necessarily for you as a reader. Yeah, but it's almost as if they published them outright. Yeah, but as far as saying what he want, what he wants you right. to no, understand as he's reading it. He has to like talk about all these things, sure. I guess, or he feels that he has to talk about all these things. Yep. And again, I, I understand. I, I kind of get where he's coming from. It just doesn't necessarily make engaging reading. Exactly. That's very well said, and I think we all agree with that. So now we're on to uh, twenty-three, which is painting as a model. And actually, I find this very fascinating too because I'm a big uh, Wittgenstein fan, mm. and. He discusses in the Tractatus, in this very Tractarian view, the idea that we we see the world as a frame, uh, like it's a picture. Mm-hmm. It's a picture of reality. Sure. It's, and we don't really have access to that, uh, to the true reality. It's, again, it goes back to a very platonic viewpoint, too. And we, we mentioned this already. Like, he, he kind of retreading older topics and bringing different viewpoints of it in. Yeah. But... This is what that entire thing is, that it's kind of like the philosophy of what is art and how art is created. And it's basically a copy of this reality. That, again, the oh, writerly text, reality, the, yeah. it, the readerly text is the art, the writerly text is the idea of it. Mm-hmm. And and it's very much kind of, without saying it, it really deals with the, like, the platonic copies. Yeah. But I don't really have much else to say about that. No, again, like it brings up it, an interesting, like, at, at the the core kernel, I guess I want to say, is a a interesting and b relevant thing, but he sort of like peripherally you know goes over it, and again and now back to your regularly scheduled analysis of Theracene. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the idea of access to reality is actually an important part of Saracene. The idea that there's only one inlet to the reality of this story, even if it's of accessibility, even if I it's guess. not necessarily yeah. the actual reality. The whole, it doesn't really the whole matter. Po- like the the whole like, point of the story yeah. is that there is one person 
in this party that knows what the story is, and that is who you're going to hear the story from. Yeah. And I think that's kind of an Even interesting idea. Even if it's idea. the true story. Yeah. Whether or not it's the true it's a, story. Yeah, that, it's sort of like it's neither here nor there at, at that point. It's the story that the that reader you're getting. gets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, he doesn't really bring that up in, like, yeah, I agree completely with what you said. He doesn't. I mean, I'm kind of reading yeah. between the lines here for sure, but, you know, that's that's kind of an idea that I get out of that, which, mm-hmm. I mean, like I said earlier, I think a lot of these things, uh, I think a lot of these asides are... A, they're much more interesting than the actual close reading. Yeah. And B, I think that they are ide- ideas that Bart looks at and says, hmm, this might be interesting to look into. <laughs> yeah. Let me just like put a little fucking thing Let about it Let me stop it, it in there. And then, sure. uh, and then we'll see if anybody else has something interesting to say about it. And like, that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Like, yeah. I try to read into those a little bit, you know? So I want to read off a quote here, which I think was kind of, uh, again, I think this is, exemplifies his musings here. Mm. All of which raises a twofold problem. First, where and when did this uh, preeminence of the pictorial code in literary mimesis begin? Why has it disappeared? Why has the writer's dream of painting died out? What has replaced it? Nowadays, the represent- uh, representational codes are shattered to make room for a multiple space, no longer based on painting the picture, but rather on the theater, the stage, as Mal- Malarme predicted, or at least wished. And then if literature and painting are no longer held in a hierarchical reflection, one being the rear view mirror um, for the other, why maintain them any longer as objects at once united and separate? In short, classified together, why not wipe out the difference between them, purely one of substance? Why not forego the plurality of the arts in order to affirm more powerfully the plurality of texts? And again, it's he's asking a lot of questions, providing very little answers. No answers, to them. yeah, exactly. And again, I feel like this is personal notes he's writing here, mm. or at least yeah, they're like yeah, he's out. again they're fleshed out post-it notes. So I think is the the funniest thing you uh, the way to describe what these seem like to read. Yeah. So, 24 is the transfer- transformation as a game, in which he basically is saying that, oh, uh, like, what are metaphors? And how metaphors are ruled games for, I, I like the thing, that which is the compounding of synonyms. Mm. And he basically is describing how metaphors work. Yeah, which, and that's about <laughs> again, it. Like, yeah. 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 Which is cool. interesting, yes. I mean, th- thank you, Bart, but... If, you, what, if yeah. you read a good amount, you should know what metaphors are. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> but again, it's it's him trying to bring uh, – it's describing an art of an art versus describing the science of an art. Yeah, sure. And, that's, that's that's a good distinction. Mm. And again, this is where he kind of – where Bart falls apart for me because he's uh, – his the scope he's trying to address is – not focused enough yeah. or yeah he loses focus yes. here and there agreed so 25 between uh, between 25 and 26 is the portrait and signified and truth which is getting into some of the more like grandiloquent yes <laughs> aspects of his work <laughs> grandiloquent i like it uh, if they weren't before, they certainly are in these sections. Scott, do you have any quotes for us? So, I mean, not really. Like this, these two are like, as I just said, sort of beyond pretentiousness in a certain <laughs> sense, and like even within the framework that you've already now, you know, you've gone through this far of his uh, analysis and his little musings, but not really. It's all just like not babbling per se, but it's not quite relevant. I would say, like, I actually in, in my notes I the, said that um, it seemed very out of place. Yes, for sure. It's it's some of the most jarring stuff, and it might be like sure generally relevant. Well, but, let's say that. Well, let's do this. Uh, what exactly do you guys think that he is saying in these? And then we can probably move on from it. But like, okay, what I had was that one of the things he's discussing is his codes. And the use of which are kind of static mm. and which al- allow use to create like linear action. Fluidity, yeah. So in a sense, what, what's the difference between a painting and like a movie in a right. sense? And mm. uh, uh, the, the temporal codes that uh, drive a, uh, um, a narrative. He also 
what defines an object? What signifies a proper name? Mm -hmm. And the idea of that, like all these uh, uh, sems and their uh, and the adjectives that describe a thing, it's uh, to me it's a lot like set theory without saying it's set theory that it is a group of like almost metaphysical. uh, I I would say yeah, it's that like subset. Uh, set A, this is element A, element B, element C, all unite to define what this is. Yeah. The only thing is that I feel that he uses, again, going back to that castration metaphor, his, he feels that castration is the defining characteristic when I feel that it's just another One member of, of the, the set. One of the yeah. yeah. Right. An element. Sure. So, yeah. Th- that's what I got out it's of the this se- section. Like that- as far as the signified yeah. and the truth, I think the idea is like, what? what's the difference what's the difference between the description of a thing and that thing itself, right? Well, again, if you want to go, like, you debate object identity here, like, what what is the, well, what that's, creates the thing? That's kind of why, yeah. why, that's kind of why I said, like, it, 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 it seems to hint at a metaphysical yes. explanation, but doesn't necessarily go into it. Yes. Again, in this, yeah. uh, it, it's not, I think you mentioned it as meandering or before. It's, it's very, in a sense, poetic. It's very mm. much, you can see the passion that went into this, but you can also see that, like, is he hiding something behind the grand language here? Right. Like, yeah. he has, yeah, that's, he doesn't I, want to seem well stupid, said, yeah. but he has a question that he doesn't w- want to seem like he doesn't have the answer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> really well Perhaps. put. Perhaps. And uh, <laughs> Perhaps. I, I, I did, again, the more I think about it, the more I get the sense out of it, at least in these, this um, section of sections, if you will. All right. Now, I think the. Oddly enough, I think this is the no, no, not the last one, but the antithesis to in section um, twenty-seven actually had a very interesting point, where it's the idea that the tension that tension is born from these two the the two disparate parts conflicting, right? And that's where narrative tension comes from. Sure, I don't think that's necessarily one hundred percent. True, but I think that is an element it's of a, tension. Again, it has yeah. You can see the core of that that is relevant, if not a hundred percent all the time. I guess I want to say. Yeah, I, I would say that a lot of truth comes from that. Whether or not it's one hundred percent true right. is an argument right. for another That's what I'm day. Saying. I would certainly say. it's valid but to an extent. I, I think I think of his arguments, this is perhaps one of the better ones. The idea that, as you said, tension is born from the disparate parts. Perhaps going even further, trying to work together as part of the same plot. Mm. It's plate tectonics of narrative. Right. Yeah. But that earthquake that you get from the rubbing of the plate tectonics is what exactly what you need for a good plot, you know? Mm. You need those earthquakes. All right. So we're on to uh, 28 now with character and figure, which, again, is going into that set kind of theory uh right. what defines a it's character it's not a little a, a facet of, of what uh, something you brought up before but i think the most interesting part of the section is the power of i mm. uh as a term in narrative a qualifier and that will, yeah. it's oddly enough it's very it's both very personal and very impersonal at the same time because it it's less definition of like the narrative the narrator in saracen has no defining characteristics really because he is he is the the eye it's you're supposed to project but yourself to right. some extent upon him but at the same time yeah. i think that saying i makes it like the fact that the narrator says i makes it another person outside of yourself mm. sure it's like levels and levels like the, the turtles all the way down thing we right. sort of said like yeah the concept of i as both a abstract concept as a framework, I guess psychologically, and also as uh, a character within literature, when explored and used to a certain degree that uh, Bars is talking about, will have a different effect upon you as a reader mm. because of the way, like because again, as as he was saying, sort of like the uh, the cultural or the linguistical baggage that comes along with it. I guess I want to say. It is an illegal, impersonal, uh, anachronistic configuration of symbolic relationships. Yeah, sure. Yes. Well, that's uh, that's how he writes. Sure, it is. It's it's all. I that, mean, yes, I it is. If you Thanks. think about it, he doesn't have to describe it in such terms. Wait, but he says illegal. It, that 
Uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yes. and illegal. Yep, and personal. <laughs> I read it correctly. All right. So again, th- this is I think one of the, di- the that makes him a difficult read is that he has a way with words. To put it politely, <laughs> sure. Yes, he so, does have a way. With yeah, words. I'm not gonna. Uh, Who knows what way that is? That. So I'm. We're gonna skip over 29 uh, uh, because it, they're called the alabaster lamp because it is. Basically, a prolonged example of uh, symbolism. Yes. It's super specific. That, yes. And, yeah. Which doesn't really add much aside from kind of yeah, giving again, you an uh, example of... I'll say this about it. He had a post-it note that says to himself, explore this at length, but it doesn't really... It doesn't add all that much. <laughs> just just talk a lot yeah. of... Just talk about this a lot. Exactly. Okay, so 30 through 31, I... Is beyond and short and the disturbed replication, which I in my notes call platonic castration. <laughs> yes, it might as well be, I suppose. So it's um, basically saying that like the origin of a work is inaccessible. Yeah, and that oddly enough, it's sort of that to bring it back to castration for a second. The writerly text is the perfect work. There's the like, like La Zambinella, it's the idea of like La Zambinella, which is the castrato in Saracen, is viewed as the perfect woman by Saracen, but it turns out to be right. it's the imperfect an castrato. vision. Yeah. So, or false representation, kind of. Yeah, it is. But that's the idea that going yeah. back to the thing is that the writerly text is the castration right. of the uh, writerly text. And mm-hmm. again, I'm thinking he's reading too much into castration, yeah. but uh, he loves castration. Paging Doctor Freud loves yes. it. I would like to see what Freud had, would have to say about <laughs> SZ. All right, so we're on to 32. thirty-two. So almost done. Delay, which is going back to the uh, Hermetic Code, and. Actually, I thought this was a very interesting part, which is the idea that is the job of the writer to because, in a way, if you just write the uh, the Hermetic Code as in here's the question, here's the answer to the question, it's gonna be a very short story. Sure, yeah. So it is the job of the writer to naturally delay sort of disguise the delay ending. the answer, yeah. And I think it's again, it's it's kind of an intuitive. Thing like it, oh yeah, like it that's... seems obvious in retrospect. But yeah. also, I would say, I, and, and I agree, this is one of the very interesting points that he brings up. It's something that yes, is if you're writing a story, that's what you do. But it's not necessarily something that you think about, and yes, you don't sure. you don't necessarily exactly. think about why you do it. It's just you do it because it's done. And the more that you think about something like this, I think the better handle on how to do it well that you can get. Well, quickly, I think that ties in somewhat um to our inner. Uh, the first in our TED Talk series, where I think believe Andrew Sand says something like that, mm-hmm. where like, yeah, it it seems like it's so glaringly obvious when you're creating it, but if you forget about it, if you don't, if you ignore it, then it's going to show, right. and you're going to have a bad story. Well, narrative closure is seems so obvious now, but it's something I never actually really thought of. Sure. The idea that everything asks questions once it's the brought job to light, to... then you, yeah. So yeah, enough seeing it everywhere. So just like. Bart saw castration everywhere <laughs> once he started writing about it. Yeah, fair enough. It's so all recursive. On to uh, 33, which is end slash or, which basically says there is no hierarchy to codes, that no, yeah. no, no specific no code that... takes precedence exactly. over another, that they all have equal value. They're all there. And that you start to kind of dismantle the, um, uh, the neutrality if you start giving preference to yeah. one over others. They're all right. interwoven, but there's not like you can't, even though like, like we said, uh, we laid out the five codes. It's not like number one is the most important. Right. They're all equally important. They all equally flow in and out of, it, of the whole I thing. I think this is another th- this important thing to think about in terms of, I, I guess in terms of writing is the idea that, yeah, you will see things laid out in a certain way, often in the same order. But that doesn't mean that one thing is more important than the other. It all depends on what you're writing or what you're reading. What you're writing or what you're reading are going to 
determine which of those sure. codes are more or less important to you. Right. Or which one you're like sort of uh, adhering to the most. Right. Yeah. And uh, the, the thing I think for a writer, it would be great to have the viewpoint of the codes so that if you're giving precedence to one over others or ignoring one of the codes, right, exactly. it can help you balance out. out and I think, I think, honestly, I think these codes, uh, at least the codes that um, are laid out in the mm-hmm. beginning, are so ingrained in the process of storytelling that a writer... Or at least they who, should clearly well, be. But... I would say a writer who's at the top or cl- near the top of their game or near the top of what they can do shouldn't even really be thinking yeah, about them as they're writing. This goes back to the concept of intu- uh, like that storytelling and language is such an intuitive process that we don't generally pay attention. Yeah, it's almost a subconscious so, yeah, process. So yeah, someone who mastered an art of narrative doesn't have to right. doesn't like yeah. doesn't pay attention to what the rules are it's not but, that it's not that they don't pay attention yeah. to it it's so ingrained in them yes. that that those rules are built into their writing they're like de facto already, already doing it you yeah. know sure but i have certainly seen uh works that have leaned heavily on symbolism and i think or, or referential i think work. that there's i think that there's a point where you read this and you say something's wrong with what i'm writing mm. and then you say i have to go back and look at you know, the codes of whatever code I'm writing by and figure out what I'm leaving out, what I'm messing up, like that type of thing. But sure. as far as the as far as the codes of writing, as far as the rules of writing go, I think that if you think about them too much, you will you give yourself the yips, basically. <laughs> right. So speaking, this is very fitting to that last comment, uh, Steve-O. <laughs> the next section... 34 is the prattle of the meaning which is probably one of the best titled uh little asides that he <laughs> because he's definitely been prattling on about meaning for at length for now at so this point i'm actually going to read this entire section and you the reader can decide suffer for any fictional action given in the discourse of the classical novel there exist three possible realms of expression either the meaning is stated, the action named but not detailed uh, to accompany with anxious solicitude, uh, which is, I think, an example of that. Yeah. Or while the meaning is being set forth, the action is more than named. It is described, i.e., um, I. Uh, to watch with concern the ground where the person one is guarding is setting his feet, or else the action is described, but its meaning is kept tacit. The action is merely conno- uh, connotated. connoted. Uh, in the strict sense of the word, from implicit signified, i.e., to watch the old man slowly advance on his feeble feet. The first two uh, realms, in terms of which signif- signification is excessively named, impose a dense uh, plenitude, plenitude of, meaning. of meaning, or if one prefers, a certain redundancy, a kind of semantic prattle t- typical of the uh, archaic. Or, uh, or infantile era of modern discourse marked by the excessive fear of failing to communicate meaning its basis. Uh, whence, in reaction in our latest or new novels, the practice of the third system to state the event without accompanying it with its signification. So, certainly is a kind of redundancy. Yes. But, but sure, I mean, like, as facetious as that may be. I mean, like, I, 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 hate this, I hate to admit this, but to listen to that being read, it's very difficult to follow. And it was difficult to follow while I was reading it mm. as well. Sure. Well, I think what he's trying to say is that there used to be a practice in uh, writing. It which was done was this like, way yeah, like, earlier in or earlier Or to hammer forms. home a point where now it's attempting to do mm. just kind of a – in a sense, a more Hemingway style, which is stripped of yeah. adverbs and adjectives, sort of bared and down straight angle, yeah, uh, like action versus, yeah. and you have to imply the mean, or find the implications of the meaning yourself. Again, I don't know if that's exactly what he's going for because I just read it out. It's, 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 it's prattle. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's meaningful prattle. I and guess. This is the problem prattle. with the next couple of sections we're doing. They're all like this. Yeah. So. We'll move on to the next one. Unless anyone has any other <laughs> no, 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 cuts no, no. of the problem. You've already paddled ab- uh, enough, I think. Okay. The real, the operable. So this is very interesting because it's kind of saying that, again, going to the idea of it being a copy, you can copy from the reality to a work, but you cannot create reality from the work. 
Yeah. It's a one way street. I think if if this mm-hmm. entire section just said that sentence, yeah. that would be sufficient. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that's I think that's really the best way to put it. And the one sentence is all that was needed. I'm going to throw out one sentence here. Oh, go another sentence. God damn it. The first is that the discourse has no responsibility vis-a-vis the real. In the most realistic novel, the referent has no reality. Suffice it to imagine the disorder the most orderly narrative would create or its descriptions taken at a face value, converted into operative programs and simply executed. <laughs> so well, this, again, is the, this, this is the part where he was getting into, like, computer language a yes. little bit, right? Like, Kind of, like, in a roundabout way, I would I, say. I remember this happening. I remember it being so kind of strange because no, it's it's a I, I don't know when this story came out but it was like 1800s right 1893 yeah, I but think. this is in and 19- I know the book came out in like the 60s 67 <coughs> or 8 yeah so it was very strange because the entire book he's trying to I or I feel like you're trying to get put in the frame of mind of when the original short story came out or 70, at least he's trying to like he's trying to explain it in those terms and then he starts talking about computers at this point and it was very but it's not really i think what he's it's computer really discussing language, is though. yeah it is computer language but i think that is purposeful on his part hmm. uh a choice that he's saying that you you in a sense when you attempt to create reality and he seems to have disdain for in a sense film here which you can make real Whence the inevitable destruction of the novels when they are transferred from writing to film, from a system of meaning to an order of the operable. What I think he's saying is that they, and I think he's choosing that that cold, film callous or form. Op, uh, computer language in order to say that you, when you attempt to when you try to create reality off of it, you're stripping the art and leaving only the function. Perhaps. Okay. But it just, it just seemed like such a break from the... And it, he never went back to that, I don't think. So, like, it just seemed like such a break from where he had been and where he went after that. Yes. That it's, it stood out to me. So maybe Even that's, amongst the ones Maybe that's what sure. he wanted for, for that section to stand out. But, like, it, the only reason that it stood out was because I was like, oh, this is strange that he's talking about the way that computers work now or, like, you know, <laughs> the, like yeah. how, how computer language works. And then we go back to like the 1800s and Saracene and France. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it's just it just seems so weird, o- out of place, I guess. Well, it's the timeless nature of the jarring narrative. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you got to jar people. It's well said. So we're on to the penultimate of this section, which is 36, folding and unfolding. Now, basically, what this is saying is that you how to overread a verb. <laughs> Which has already been addressed well enough, I think, throughout. All sure. right, we've done so. We have for instance, we've the, overread many things beyond not just verbs. The use uh, the verb to enter, it can be unfolded to to appear or to penetrate. To leave can be given. I can fold it to to want to to stop to leave again. So the idea is that it's basically. All the potentials of what a verb can say, the possible uh, permutations, stripped of context, yeah, right, and then overanalyzing it based upon all the potentials of what they are. Again, I don't necessarily I see what he's going for here, but I think that is him giving preference to one code while ignoring others. I will say this: I I like in theory, like sort of how you have an affinity to uh, philosoph- uh, linguistical studies and so forth. I like thinking about all the possible interpretations of a verb or any word whatsoever, but it again, that's nice, thanks, but there's no reason for it to necessarily be here at this point in time. Here's the other thing that I would say about this book in general, before we get to the finale, 37. I think that he starts off by saying that there are so many interpretations that you can have of, like, a story, and, like, here's mine. But then he strips it down and says, 
this is what the interpretation is like throughout the book, and that's right. kind of no, the right that was way, kind of jarring to me. Here's the thing: is that, but that's the problem with me. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't because at certain points he's like, "This is the specific interpretation." And other times he's like, "Oh, here's the infinite possibilities of interpretation." And then, oh no, but here's one. Int- he's so he sort of wavers back and forth, bouncing around here. Yeah, I I think I wrote myself a note at some point that said like, I am glad that. This book says that, you know, art should be interpreted in and of itself or like art should be interpreted in, a, in in your own personal way. But then I wish that I didn't have to read the rest of Bart's <laughs> interpretation of it. Sure. That's really you know? funny and well put. Yeah. So Bart just proves Susan T- Sontag is correct. <laughs> yeah. In Perhaps. a weirdly like reverse way, but sure. Right. Scott, would you like to – because you actually expressed interest in discussing this last yes. part. So, so 37 is the uh, humanetic sentence, and I'll lead off uh, – it opens with, The proposition of truth is a, in quotes, well-made sentence. It contains a subject, the theme of the enigma, a statement of the question, the formulation of the enigma, its question mark, proposal of the enigma, <laughs> various subordinate and interrelated causes and catalysts, uh, delays in the answer – all of which precede the ultimate predicate, the disclosure. So basically, again, like it's almost as if like the most intricate diagramming of a sentence possible and right. or a story. So, I mean, again, it, it makes sense. It's just that he sort of takes a very winding road to arrive at a conclusion, which is valid and accurate. I, I will say that it's just that, you know, it could be, again, how we just uh, condensed one section down into one sentence. This one can be the same way, even though I think it may be one of the most important points to, uh, again to keep in mind while being a sto- like while storytelling. But this is actually going to his points of this work. It is yes. the concept sure. of like here's my initial thesis, mm-hmm. and here's a more detailed description of one of the You're sections right. of my et cetera, thesis. Et cetera, et cetera. Sure, and I like this section for that, and it, it makes every other section that really doesn't address his core proposition feel unnecessary yes right i agree with that i think a lot of the other sections he felt like he had to put something in or he was at was it add this know. one he he absolutely wanted to say something yeah this you is, know like you could feel yeah. that he wanted to say at something. the end of the day this one's more uh substantive i would say whether or not you know the others you you agree with his reading of the story whether or not you agree with a lot of the other things that he says he wanted to say something about story in this final section. Right, and in, I think in does. The, in 37. I think achieves it well enough. I shouldn't say this final section. There's right. a lot more. So yeah. much At the more. end of this uh, part. So we're cutting it off here because this is actually within the story when the introduction sort of ends of Saracen, which is the first third of uh, mm-hmm. right. the, they decide to go into the story now of Saracen, La Zampanilla. And I, yeah, you don't get that context because – it's it feels very arbitrary because but it makes sense based on where they are in the story. Right. Right. But um and we need to cut off anywhere or we're gonna go for like five hours on this. <laughs> Anyone else have any final thoughts or we'll just see you next time on uh part three? I think mm-hmm. we'll just see you next time. Yes. yes. I've said all that I have to say. I'm Jonathan Ian Manzer here with Scott Thurler. I am Roland Barst out of this episode. <laughs> and Stephen Nermosi. <laughs> have a good night. This has been the Neophytes of Narratology. We hope that you've experienced an epiphany or two of the literary nature, but only metaphorically, of course. Music by Christopher Morgan. Editing and engineering by Jonathan E. Mazur.